Modern hardware is amazing. Advances in hardware have changed what's possible. We've access to vast stores of information that we can process using billions of instructions per second on networks comprising of thousands of different devices with 24-7 access. So how should we design our software systems to take advantage of this amazing hardware? That was the idea behind the Reactive Manifesto that I was involved in writing a few years ago. The, an idea that's probably best summed up by 21st century problems are not best solved with 20th century software architectures. So what are reactive systems and how do they help? Hi, I'm Dave Farley of Continuous Delivery and welcome to my channel. If you haven't been here before, please do hit subscribe and if you enjoy the content, hit like as well. I'd like to begin by thanking our sponsors, Harness, Equal Experts, Octopus and Specflow. They're helping us to build our channel and so please do support them by checking their details out. There are links in the description below. The Reactive Manifesto describes an interesting approach to software architecture. It recently got its 30,000th signature. As one of the authors, now seems like a nice time to talk about the ideas behind it. So in this episode, let's explore the idea of reactive systems. I hinted about some of these ideas in a previous video, where I asked the question, what if we constrain synchrony? Well, when we do, we get lots of interesting benefits. I was involved in one of those software projects that shaped how I think about software. It had several interestingly different characteristics. We started talking about the approach publicly, mainly to help with recruitment, to be honest, which kind of ended up with me being here talking to you now, I suppose. But it also meant that I was asked to contribute to the, to the Reactive Manifesto. The manifesto was started by Jonas Bonner and Roland Kuhn. Uh, who had built an actor-based system called ACA. They used some of our open source high performance technology to significantly improve the performance of ACA. So when they were started writing the manifesto, they asked me and my colleague Martin Thompson to contribute. So what's this all about? A reactive system is a distributed system that exhibits a number of useful, interesting characteristics. To quote the manifesto, these systems are more robust, more resilient, more flexible, and better positioned to meet modern demands. A reactive system is responsive. This means that it responds in a timely manner. This is a cornerstone of usability and also means that reactive systems are very quick to detect problems when they begin to arise. They're resilient. That is, they remain responsive in the face of failure. Resilience depends on replication, containment, isolation, and delegation. Reactive systems are also elastic, meaning that they remain responsive under varying workload too. They respond to change in the input rate by increasing or decreasing the resources that services uh, that input. This ability is delivered through decentralized architecture, no contention points, and ensuring that there are no central bottlenecks anywhere in the system. The core idea, though, that underpins everything else is that they are message driven. Reactive systems are based on asynchronous message passing. This forms the foundation for all of these other properties. It also means that reactive systems are naturally more loosely coupled, have greater isolation, location transparency, and the ability to delegate errors to other parts of the system. Systems that are built like this are flexible, loosely coupled and scalable. I think that they're also easier to develop. Though quite a lot of people disagree with me on that last one. Nevertheless, I'm going to try and convince you through this video. These systems are certainly more tolerant of failure. They respond to failure gracefully and they're virtually always there to be responsive to users. I've spoken about asynchronous communications in a previous video. If you haven't watched that one, do take a look. But today I want to explore this approach from a more practical perspective. Let's imagine a little black box of code that does something useful. That little black box only accepts asynchronous messages. 
and it only publishes asynchronous messages. If you want it to do something useful, you send it a message. If you're interested in what it did or what it does, you listen to its messages. So the messages are all that, that we understand about or, and all that we care about with this little black box. Let's just cheat for a moment and take a peek inside the box. The code responds to a message and sends out a new one. In between, it can do anything it likes, but it does all of it on a single thread. So in the simplest, fastest case, our little black box takes in a message, maybe updates its internal state in some way, and then sends out a new message. That's it. Let's be more specific. Let's imagine that we're building a bookstore out of these little black boxes. And our store consists of two of these boxes, the store and the warehouse. We place a, an order for a book called continuous delivery. The store updates its state to capture that order, maybe creating an order record of some kind internally. Perhaps initialized with a state of ordered and including relevant details of the order. Then the store publishes a message saying order placed, including any relevant details of the order. Think about the simplicity of this code for just a moment. No concurrency, simple changes, you can write code like this for even very complex business cases that executes in nanoseconds. Once that single thread is finished, it's free to process more orders or anything else. Our UI is listening for updates uh, and it updates the user's view when it sees an acknowledgement of the order. At this point, people more used to synchronous systems often worry about the performance of this. But actually, at the level of bits and bytes and CPUs, there's less work to do here, not more. So this is often more responsive in some ways, faster than a synchronous call, not slower. The real advantage, though, is that we are no longer coupled in time. There's nothing waiting for a response. There are just things ready for those responses. Meanwhile, our warehouse is also listening to the same order placed message. When it sees it, it decrements its count of the stock for that book and dispatches the book. If the count falls below some minimum stock level inside the warehouse, perhaps it sends a replenish stock message or something similar to order new books. Finally, the, when the warehouse has finished processing the, the, the dispatch of the book, it sends out a new message saying book dispatched to confirm that they were on their way. Our bookstore handles that message in the same way that it handles any other message. As a discrete message, no special backdoor for responses like async await, for example. This message comes in through the front door, and the content of the message tells us what it's related to. In this case, an order for a particular account for the rather excellent book, Continuous Delivery. Our store responds by changing the status of the order for the book, from ordered to dispatched, perhaps. And then it publishes its own new message, order dispatched. If the UI is still listening, it can update and tell the, the user that the, the book is now on its way. It doesn't have to be there, but if it is, it will be up to date. All of that is pretty straightforward. I hope, hopefully, it's simple to follow, and I'm sure that you can imagine writing code that looked like that. Let's look, though, at some of the corner cases, because this is where these sorts of systems really shine. What if the book was withdrawn before the order was received? Well, the store could send a sorry, no longer available response. What if the book was out of stock in the warehouse? Well, the order's already been placed. The store knows that the order exists. It's got a record. Um, presumably the warehouse is a list of outstanding orders that it maintains. A list of orders waiting, on, waiting for new stock or something like that. As soon as the stock arrives at the warehouse, it can start processing, uh, running through that list and, and, and checking them off against the stock that's arrived. At some point in the future, milliseconds or later, when it does arrive, the warehouse will be running through the list of outstanding orders, and it, when it gets to our book, it will publish a book dispatched message. Same as before. 
and the store can respond. Same as before. No need for any special cases here. Uh, no need for the store to know anything about any of this. All it's doing is responding to book dispatched messages. That's one way to uh, in which this approach is more resilient. It works whatever the time scale, whether the warehouse responds in nanoseconds or months, the processing is the same. What if a meteorite hit the data center where our warehouse lives? Well, as long as we can replay all of the messages in order, remember messages are the only way that the warehouse changes, then we can recover its state even if we restart it somewhere else. Presumably in a less astronomically compromised district. Think about the store for a moment. It's still free to take orders while all of this is going on. We can place an order for a second excellent book, continuous delivery pipelines, for example, even though the warehouse is currently a smoking ruin. When the new data center and warehouse come back online, it processes the same incoming messages as before and replays any messages that it hadn't seen before because the messaging system looked after those. It generates the same outgoing messages as before too. So our store continues to work as before. Again, no special cases. Of course, in this case, we may want a special case. What if we wanted to inform our customers uh, of our interrupted service due to astronomy? Well, the store knows the orders were placed. So we can ask it for the list of orders that were ordered but not yet dispatched. Then we can do whatever we like. Send apologies for the delay or cancel the orders with our regrets. Whatever makes sense to the business. I want to bring something to your attention. The only technical assumption here that the, the store and the warehouse or any other service has is that the messages are sent and that they'll arrive at some point. We'll need to be smart to offer that level of service, but that's the only technical assumption that our services are aware of or make. The only knowledge of the outside world that they need. Ideally, we want guaranteed once-only delivery. Computer scientists will say that this is impossible and they're correct, but practically you can get close enough. And you can make the corner cases where the data may be lost visible so that you can cope with them if they do arise, in all but, but, the, but the most extreme of circumstances. And we're talking here about asteroid impacts rather than meteorites here in which case we have bigger problems to worry about than a lost order for my book. Actually, these corner cases always exist, whatever the approach, so you've lost nothing compared with other designs. Given that our messages will get through eventually, then the only code we need to write is the logic that I've described here. The domain logic of the problem that we are solving, in this case, book buying. What do I mean by that? Well, let's imagine that we only have the pieces that I've described so far. How do we store our orders? Well, sure, we could do the conventional thing. We could back up our store with a database of some kind. Um, and an order comes in, we create a record, we store it in the database and send an order placed message. This will certainly work. And for some kinds of service, it's quite a nice, simple way of doing things. But there's an alternative. Remember what I said. Messages are the only way to change a service. So we could just keep the order in memory. If we stop the store at any point, as long as we can replay all of the orders it's ever seen, then we can recreate its state completely. So we could do this instead. We could record the stream of messages as they arrive and then replay them on a restart in the same order that we received them. We process the same messages in the store, same as ever. Think about what this means for the system and our code. If we'd had infrastructure that managed the messages for us, the only code that we need to write is the domain logic of our system and our UI. There's more. We have seen the resilience of being able to recover from meteorites, but we can also carry on when the meteorites visit too. Let's imagine that we have two warehouses instead of one in different data centers, in different geographies. When the meteorites visit, the backup warehouse carries on. 
once it notices that is that the live version is not responding. Yes, this is just clustering, but notice that the code itself didn't need to change in any way to make any of this clustering work. The infrastructure can do that for us too. The location transparency that messaging gives to us makes this feature relatively simple to add to our infrastructure for any service. What about changes in load? Well, let's imagine that these books are so popular that the store can't keep up. I wish that were true. Then we could simply create another store. We could choose a variety of strategies to allocate load between our stores, but all of them don't need the store itself to care about how any of that works. It's outside the view of the store. This approach separates the accidental complexity of a system, that stuff that's about running stuff on a computer, from the essential complexity, the domain logic, the, the function that we are really interested in, to a greater degree than any other approach that I have ever seen. It allows us to build systems focus more on the problem that we are trying to solve. And these systems are amongst the fastest, most efficient systems in the world. If you're nervous about the reliability of storing and retrieving this stream of events in the way that I've described, don't be. This is how relational databases work internally. If you're worried about the performance of those single threads within our services, the core of our exchange that was built this way could process 6.5 million trades per second on a single thread. So it will probably be okay. Thank you very much for watching.